Hi there, I'm David Staples with the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Leanne Falder of the Journal. Hey, Leanne. Hello, David. How's it going? It is going okay. I'm kind of, I am uh, resigned to the quarantine now. I'm learning to live with it. I'm oh. not fighting it so much anymore, and I'm just trying to roll with it. What did it look like? When you, what did it look like when you were fighting it? <laughs> I was a lot more frustrated <laughs> by everything, and I'm just trying to not be so frustrated and just uh, yeah. a little more uh, just accepting of it and uh, trying to take care of take care of what I can take care of. So I'm starting like lift weights, exercise uh -huh. more, that kind of stuff. We're cleaning the house fanatically, organizing oh, things. Oh yeah. Well, you and I have flipped positions then because I was very accepting in the beginning and I've cleaned the house within an inch of its life. And now I'm mad because just today they announced that tennis courts are going to be, you know, shut for the immediate future. Yeah. And I love tennis. It's my, it's my fun. It's my happy place. And so I'm very, very sad about that. Very sad. Anyway, but I'm not going to fight it. Serenity. I'm not going to climb that big fence <laughs> with my racket. Serenity now. Mm -hmm. See, I don't, like, I'd like to know the thinking behind that. I don't get it, Leanne. I know. Like, that's not... two people in the out of doors. I anyway. Know. I know, I know, I know. However, all right. What you, what you got? You want to go first? You, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, the first two I'm going to read are, are just sort of flip sides of this issue. Um, one, the first one is from um, the Alberta restaurant owner, Corey Morgan, at Corey B. Morgan on Twitter. I wonder if the decision makers who feel that we should continue locking down the healthy would feel differently if they suddenly had to try and live on $2,000 a month. Yeah, so this speaks to a real, one of the big divides, doesn't yeah. it, in, in what's yeah. going on. The people who, uh, Corey Morgan is a well-known person on Twitter. He's quite, uh, he's conservative, um, you know, um, and a business owner, I believe. I think he owns a restaurant. And mm -hmm. you have to just like... feel for people like that. Everyone in the restaurant. There's so many industries that are going to be so profoundly impacted by this. And so there's all these people that are just walking on eggshells in terms of their, their economic life. And then there's a whole other group who are more concerned with the health aspects of it. Yeah. And there seems to be. There isn't there always, is a... but sometimes there's an overlap between economic security, whether you know for sure you're going to have a job or not and whether you you don't and then so anyway i just think both concerns are so valid like yeah. the health concerns are so valid and the economic concerns and just hard job weighing them both do you mind if i just read my second tweet right back to back to the first Go one ahead. So yeah because i know they're related they yeah. relate so the second tweet is from edmonton resident garth norris at garth norris i wonder what the 2600 pardon me i wonder what the 2560 canadians who have died from covid and their families think about rushing to open up the country because people are tired of being confined, feel it is inconvenient or are feeling financial pressure. So see previous reference. This is the flip side of that argument. People are frustrated um, when they hear others saying it's time for us to get out when people are dying um, and families are losing their loved ones. So that is, uh, there is an, um, there's a tension between those two perspectives that's not going to be easy to resolve. Yeah, I'd like to say, like, in some ways, it's kind of a false argument, because I think that Corey Morgan would also have concerns about the health issues. And I think that uh, Garth Norris would also have concerns about the economy. Yeah. And when you're taking a point in a debate, like when you're making it a point in a the debate, like you're kind of it looks like you're taking one side, but I don't think there's anyone, any politician right now who's opening things up. They're not they're, they're It's not like they have no concern at all. And, no, and the same for the people who say let's let's be careful. It's not like they're worried about the economy, but I think there really is real tension between people. You know, based on which one they put more weight on right now, and and uh, it's gonna, the debate's going to be ongoing, and and it's going to be pretty heated. I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Here we go. Toronto Star reporter Jennifer Yang. She worked at the Journal, right? I don't think so, but maybe. It doesn't sound maybe, familiar um, to me. Yeah. Okay, here's Jennifer what she Fong says. Jennifer Fong used to work at the journal. Who? Jennifer Fong used to work at the journal. Oh, Jennifer Fong. Gotcha. They, That's what right. you're thinking. Here's the quote. I might be thinking of that person. Okay. 
it is insane to expect parents to work full-time jobs while being full-time parents. This pandemic clearly isn't going anywhere anytime soon, so something really needs to give, and I hope it's not parents' sanity or livelihoods. Well, this must speak to the, you know, having the homeschool issue, because really, full-time parents have always been, many full-time parents have been full-time workers. Like, that tension is nowhere near new. What is new is, the, you know, having kids out of school. Um, and or out of daycare. So that's that's the real issue here. But there's always been that tension between work and home, work and home. Yeah, you can't have, I don't think you can, you, I don't know if you could even have, like if you had a childcare worker or a nanny coming in, I don't know if you could, you, if you could continue to employ that person right now. I think you probably could. But there's a lot of people now trying to do both, take care of their kids at the same time as they're working. That's yeah. a whole new tension. Like yeah. right in your face while you're trying yeah. to do your job. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Because you can't you you can't send them to childcare, and you and you also supposed to you're supposed to be in charge of their schooling. So, yeah, man, there is it's really ramped up the tension on some people, and I I absolutely uh, have uh, empathy for people who have kids between you know anyone in the elementary school age, uh, you know where they're so in need of you and so in need yeah. of a teacher and. And and pre think about it, Leah. You can't. I mean, yeah. you know, toddlers. You can't do so one single thing <laughs> if there's a toddler in the house. Like, there's just no way. So, yeah, that that is really really tough. There is no doubt about it. Thank you. Right. Uh, oh, just quickly on that point, I think people yeah, on both ends of that perspective have to give have to really cut themselves slack. I mean, we might not all be the best parents we've ever been, and we might all be not all be the best workers we've ever been. And I really hope. That employers are also, you know, being a bit more generous in that in that respect. Okay, I'll, uh, since you read the two, I'll just read my second one. Uh, okay. Ashley Townsend. This is Ashley Townsend, director of foreign policy and defense of the United States Study Center, and he tweets: China threatens to stop Australian wine and beef imports in response to Canberra's bipartisan call for an in independent inquiry into the origins of and the response to COVID nineteen. This speaks for itself, really. So what we're seeing is a lot of hostility towards China right now. And uh, in terms of the um, their their initial covering up muzzling of this issue and and um, which led to problems around the world. And, you know, I, I, there was a someone was calling for like a, a full inquiry into what happened in China and it's absolutely necessary. But I just don't think it's it's the last thing that's going to happen because President yeah. Xi was involved in the cover up, and for him to have a full inquiry would point the finger of the Chinese people and the world right at him, mm -hmm. because he and other officials, their first instinct was to, uh, what was it, uh, the client said, shoot, shovel, and shut up. Yeah, you know, cover it up, cover it up, and it just t totally uh, blew up in the face, their face. This is going to have ongoing long-term re repercussions uh, uh, for China, and that's why I read this. And China is, of course, going to fight back. So this is going to reset world politics, um, and it's going to be one of the many impacts flowing out of this. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the next tweet I have is uh, Care of UK Palliative Care, Rachel Clark, and her Twitter is at Dr. Underscore Oxford. And she says, Dear Ab Boris Johnson, and this is a list. One, the UK has one of the worst COVID-19 death rates in the world. Two, 20,000 people have died already, probably double that. Three, lockdown was delayed. Four, PPE and testing are inadequate. Five, frontline staff are dying. And her question to the Prime Minister is, how can you possibly spin this as a success, which he has been quite cheerfully doing? Yeah, this I, I I like these tweets from around the world because it's, it's outside of a handful of governments around the world, um, every government's on the defensive. They're being attacked by their by the critics, and and it's, so in the United States, it's progressives attacking Trump. In Canada, it's conservatives attacking Trudeau. Mm -hmm. In England, it's progressives attacking Johnson. So it's it's kind of there's a certain amount of apolitical quality to it, but just know around the world there's country after country after country, people are really upset with how their government handled this. Yeah. And, you know, the, the only exceptions to that are some countries in Asia and I think New Zealand and Australia. Um, they, they tend to, the, the countries that did well, 
um, were far more vigorous in shutting things down, they also tend to be islands. Mm-hmm. Um, who, a bit more isolated. Who had the, yeah, and that, so the Korea, um, they're pretty isolated because they have North Korea sealing them off from things and um, from the rest of the world. So, um, you know, that's just one observation. I'm not saying that they didn't also have the right policies. They may well have had the right policies. And, you know, we're certainly modeling ourselves after those policies. The whole world is is thinking, mm-hmm. why couldn't we did, do what Taiwan did? Why couldn't we do what South Korea did? And to, we're beaten up. Go ahead. I tend to really take seriously what healthcare workers say. I'm listening to them really carefully these days. You know, when you heard of the stories in the United States with people wanting to get to back to work and doing those those mass protests in the southern states and and you know the healthcare workers nurses in full you know masks standing in front of those crowds and just saying nothing like their words or their lack of words in those cases just speak volumes you know they are frontline workers and they really do know what's going on and i am listening to them yeah you know, and uh, it just speaks to like we have taken really strict measures in Alberta, including the tennis courts now being shut down. Mm-hmm. And I think it speaks to the the unknown of this disease. It's still there's still all kinds of unknowns. And I think I think the Taiwan and these other countries, Australia, New Zealand, they really did get it right. Um, and, and we were we are right to emulate their policies now until more is known, until we get have a firmer sense of of the data and, and how fast this spreads in our particular um situation you know we need i think every place is going to have to come with like we're, we're gonna have to come up with our own made in alberta solution to this mm-hmm. and we're we're doing that and um that's why the measures have been so strict so far to give us bias time to make those decisions and i don't right. think we can rush into them yeah yep yeah, i agree um my tweet is from myself but it's not really uh my tweet so much i'm just pointing to a globe and mail column that ran and it's from uh uh a Canadian um, epidemiologist who was based in China for a long time and was recalled uh, from China, I think under the Trudeau government. And when this all happened, he um, he asked, he said, you know, I have all this advice I could give you, uh, Dr. Tam, Dr. Teresa Tam, the chief public health officer, can we talk about this? Uh, and he never heard back and he's pretty frustrated. And it, one of the things he's frustrated on is, um, in addition to that is the lack of uh, support for public mask use, widespread public mask use. And mm. He wrote a column in the Globe and Mail this weekend, and he, for a long time, Ta- Dr. Tam and other health officials were saying, you don't need, the public shouldn't, doesn't need to wear masks. In fact, it might make things worse because they don't know how to put them on and take them off. So they weren't in support of public, widespread use of public masks, which is really big in Asia and uh, across Asia. And um, so he, his quote is from this from this doctor, this critic of uh, Dr. Tam. Let's be frank: masks can protect all people against droplet transmitted diseases such as COVID-19. And he points to all kinds of documents that talk about health workers wearing masks, why they wear them to protect them from droplets from 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 uh, people who are infected. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, this is one of these ongoing <laughs> ongoing controversies and. Yep. I think in Alberta, Dr. Hinshaw has now been pretty positive about the public wearing masks. Uh, I'm not paying as much attention to what's happening in Ottawa anymore since this is more of a local um, effort. But um, lots of people upset about the whole mask issue. Mm-hmm. Yep. But even within the medical community still, you know, many are saying, sure, go ahead, but you don't have to, you know, which is a mixed message in and of itself. It's, it's, I still think it's not altogether, well, it isn't altogether clear. They, what was clear is initially they needed masks. They, they, you know, we didn't, almost nowhere had enough masks in North America. Nowhere had enough masks in North America. Few people were on top of enough to get masks. So there was this tension like, well, the public shouldn't be pushing for masks because we need them for medical for workers. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I think that was kind of a false there wasn't really a problem there because I don't think anyone in the public would disagree with that, that the medical mm-hmm. people needed to come first to getting masks. Mm-hmm. Maybe what was needed was a, what the U.S. CDC did, the Centers for Disease Control did about a month ago. It said, you know, there's new evidence about the mask. This disease spreads asymptomatically. If you can get a cloth mask, wear it. It makes sense. And they put out a video showing an easy way to make these masks. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, that's what that was their response. So I think there was a change about a three weeks ago, and I think that uh, Dr. Tam, if she had been a little bit more on the ball, would have just said, yeah, 
if you can wear, wear a, a mask, wear one, and here's how to make one. Just do what they did, because that seems to have stopped the controversy in the United States, and it's still boiling along in Canada. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, on a lighter note, Australian broadcaster Jenny Brocky, who is uh, on Twitter at Jenny at Jen Brocky. In other news, after a lapse of some decades, I have returned to the mint slice biscuit, hashtag isolation life. And I did relate to that because I, you know, have been very good about uh, eating Nutella for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> then just in the last six weeks, really, I have just been doing nightly deep dives into a very large jar of Nutella until I, a few days ago, I just had to throw it out, even though there was still half a jar left and that was painful. But I thought this is not good. <laughs> so I know we're all going to be giving into so, our, some of our vices here these days. So you're saying for years you weren't eating that much of it, and then yeah. suddenly that all, the like, walls came crashing in on you. Yeah, absolutely, you were, I always loved it, always loved it, but I've just kept it at bay, my longing for it. But now it's just roared, roared back, and I gave into it for for a little too long. And as I say now, I have none in the house, and it's better that way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I. Uh, I've never eaten Nutella, but really? I have my you own. You never even sampled it? No. Oh, wow. You are I'm, a sad, sad. A... <laughs> <laughs> best thing That's ever, true. I'm telling you. <laughs> Good on I've avoided it. But you know what? I So I've, I was telling like how I've started to come to peace with this thing. And, and one of the things is I've instituted an old rule, that which I've had in the past, which I'm like, I don't eat after 9 p.m. anymore. I'm like don't eat unless but I have one exception that I can eat fruit after 9 p.m. Oh okay. but other than that because but, but that, yeah. I have an apple no I, that's do you? you know well right now I just brought this in like three days ago so I'm <laughs> so hungry after 9 p.m. because I've been eating I've been eating every night at 10 or 11 right oh okay. almost just eating you know eating until then so but I put I, I had put on 10 pounds and it was like no I'm not gonna Okay. goes to one way or the other i'm not yeah. going that way anymore okay so. good man the new right. strict regime is in <laughs> all right this is uh my last uh, tweet is from former u.s secretary of labor and he's a debt for a, uh, i can't remember again if he was with obama or with clinton robert reich um but he says the covid 19 pandemic is putting the deepening class divide in america into stark relief four new classes are emerging the remotes the essentials the unpaid and the forgotten I mean, I think this this gets to what we were talking, what I was talking about, what we were talking about early on here. Where there really are these different groups of people. There's a whole group that either have lost their job already, they're not working, or they and and then they're afraid they're not going to ever work again or work anytime soon. Then there's people with secure jobs, and then there's the people who have poor health or um, um, relatives who might have poor health and are really worried about this. And then there's people who are really super healthy and they don't think about that at all. So where you line up in those four groups, I think determines your political position on a lot of the different issues in mm -hmm. terms of reopening, which mm -hmm. is this huge debate right now, which is going on around the world. When should, how should we open? When should we reopen? And we're going to find out more about this in Alberta. So you, uh, I don't know, but I think I'm looking at, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at myself. I think most of us have people in all camps. Like we have, we're worried about the health stuff and the economic stuff. Yep, yep. Because it is, I mean, there are those se separate camps, but there's a lot of overlap. And, you know, if we don't, if we don't have an affected relative ourselves who's ill, and then we know someone who's just lost their job. So we, even, even among those camps, there, there are um, common threads. All right. Uh, this is my last uh, tweet, David. Meanwhile in Canada, at Meanwhile in Canada, the tweet, re tweet reads, I am absolutely in favor of strong measures to maintain physical distancing, but our national parks should be open, not for camping, but definitely for hiking, as they should be free to encourage exercise. And they should be free to encourage exercise. Zero point in having them closed, they should open first. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to agree, but then everyone will be rushing to hike and then there'll be hordes of people hiking. I don't know. What do you think? Just seeing, I didn't know they were closed, honestly. Yeah. Well, Banff, uh, you know, the, the, the town of Banff has been oh. turning people, 
back right at the town limits. Um, their, you know, their economy is, of course, in tatters. They had 92% fewer people in the park over the, over the long weekend of Easter than they did the year before. Well, one of the disputed facts, one of the things that the scientists are working out is, okay, does how readily does this transmit outside, especially when it's warm out? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Dr. Hinshaw has urged us to get outside and, and be outside. So I don't quite understand how some of these measures, banning tennis, banning golf. Yeah. Now, maybe there's maybe there's, there's related um, things involving restaurants, people working indoors that have to be there if you have these outdoor activities going. Maybe that's it. But on the other hand, like, this is one of the things, this is the one thing actually where it's not really adding up for me, our, our approach in Alberta um, is shutting down some of these things. Like a tennis, tennis, you're not even that close to the other person. Golf. No, you're not. I'm having a, I'm having a hard time figuring it out, but I, you know what, it's, it's it, for now, um, go for a walk, I guess. But uh, I mean, I've been walking in our Edmonton parks. Just think of some of, if all of our Edmonton parks were shut down as well, that would be yeah, it would be desperate. Yeah, they are. I'm really not sure. I'm well not sure. Used. They are being well used. I've taken up. I went and bought myself a new a new bicycle this past week. I had my bicycle stolen a couple of years ago, and I hadn't had one since. So, got a new bike. So I just plan to be using our bike lanes quite a bit. So yeah, just don't breathe on anyone as you ride by on your bike. I will. <laughs> <laughs> right. The whole time. <laughs> I hope that I hope that the that we we. The scientists figure it out. In warm climates, when it's hot out, what is the risk of being outdoors? Because summer's coming up, and if there isn't much, you know, hopefully this is going to change and things will open up. That's what that's what I would say about it. Like I'm accepting what they're saying right now, and I wouldn't jump over the tennis court fence to play either. And I wouldn't, you know, I'm not, I don't, you know, I accept what's happened with the golf courses. I don't, but this is there is there has been a lot of pushback on this, and. Um, the, 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 I would say that the healthcare uh, leaders really have to explain themselves well yeah. and think this through and, and in terms people, of risk will reward. People talk about fines and Go so ahead. on, and, but the reason that the quarantine works is because we accept the authority figures recommendations, right? As a, as a, as a society, we are willing to do what we're told, um, but we have to, it has to make sense to us. And if it doesn't make sense to us, sense to us at a certain point, there will not be the compliance. I mean, that's how, that's how authority figures work, right? We listen to them because we believe them. When we stop believing them, that's the problem. Yeah, and this is the problem with some of the leading health authorities, including the WHO. Like, the, yep. there's all these questions about it, and this is a real problem in the world right now. So, yeah, um, Dr. Hinshaw will have to put on her thinking cap and, and really explain these things well to us. Yes. And I don't play I don't play golf and I don't play tennis, so it's not this isn't I don't have any vested interest in this, but I. I just, I do have questions about it. Yep. Yep. Fair enough. All righty, Leanne. Thanks, thanks for talking Dave. today. Enjoyed it. See you again. Yep. Thanks Bye now. everybody for listening. Till we see you again.